Welcome to this podcast brought to you by the Vatican Observatory Foundation. I'm your co-host, Bob Tremblay. I'm a volunteer NASA JPL Solar System Ambassador, the first Vice President of Michigan's Warren Astronomical Society, and an internet factotum for the Vatican Observatory Foundation. This podcast comes from a recording of one of our monthly full moon meetups with Vatican Observatory staff and Sacred Space Astronomy subscribers. Sacred Space Astronomy is the Vatican Observatory's online community. We have several astronomers and scholars who write articles on our website about astronomy, space science, and faith in science. Every full moon, the Vatican Observatory Foundation hosts a Zoom meetup for our Sacred Space Astronomy subscribers. Typically, our guest will be a member of the Vatican Observatory staff or an affiliated researcher, and they'll tell us about the research they're doing and the journey that led them to the Vatican Observatory. Brother Guy Consomagno, director of the Vatican Observatory and president of the Vatican Observatory Foundation, will talk with our guest and our Sacred Space Astronomy subscribers can ask them questions. This podcast was taken from the Full Moon Meetup on Monday, November 30th, 2020. Our guest was Brother Bob Mackey, curator of meteorites at the Vatican Observatory. Okay, well, our guest this week is Bob Mackey. Let me start a little bit by asking, you know, where you're from and what it is that uh, got you into astronomy. First of all, the embarrassing question for you, where do you say that you are from? Where do I say that I'm from? Uh, Lacking a better answer, I say St. Louis, because my parents are from St. Louis, but my dad was Air Force, and we moved moved around quite a lot when I was growing up. Uh, So I was born in Texas, in fact, can you yeah, recite so, the different places you went to grade school? To grade school, um, believe it or not, only two places. Okay. Uh, so Grand Forks, North Dakota, and uh, and Cheyenne, Wyoming. Um, now I uh, went to high school in St. Louis, which for anyone who knows St. Louis, the St. Louis culture, that's that's kind of the the litmus test of whether you're from St. Louis is if you can answer the question, where did you go to high school? So I can answer that question, so it works. <laughs> but you did not go to the Jesuit high school. I did not, there are two Jesuit high schools in St. Louis and I did not go to either one of them. I went to Bishop Duberg High School, which is run by the diocese. So anyway, one of the things I find fascinating about your education was what you did your senior year there. Oh, my senior year, um, I was a full-time student at the University of Missouri-St. Louis. Uh, so um, I sort of conned my, uh, my teachers and the, and the principal uh, into, because I, I moved into the school uh, in my sophomore year from Wyoming, kind of convinced them that I had already taken all the classes that, um, that the sophomores take. And so they advanced me a year which meant that um, my senior year, uh, I didn't actually have any classes to take at the school. So I spent that year still as a high school student, but full-time enrolled at the university. What, what made you wanted to go to MIT? What were you hoping to do? I wanted to study physics. Where do you study physics? Well, MIT. Uh, what, what did I know about physics at that point in time? Virtually nothing. Why did I want to study it? Why not? <laughs> yeah. But, uh, okay, so you decide you want to go on and uh, study astrophysics. So where did you go to grad school? I went to Washington University in St. Louis. What they do there is they study um, pre-solar grains uh, and, um, and interstellar dust particles. These are These are, Uh, dust grain sized objects, micron sized objects that are typically uh, uh, embedded in meteorites that somehow survived intact without getting thermally processed uh, before they got embedded. So they are still intact dust grain specimens um, that were formed originally in astrophysical sources. So uh, supernova envelopes uh, or the um, atmospheres of, of asymptotic giant branch stars. And so literally we're studying stardust in the laboratory. 
So that was the connection between astrophysics and what you were doing. Did you have any kind of knowledge or background in geology at that point? I had none. Uh, while I was there, I, I took an inorganic geochemistry course. My dad, by the way, is a geologist. And so I sort of had some stuff I picked up from osmosis, but in terms of actual formal training, none at that point. Um, um, how was your dad in the Air Force also a geologist? Uh, well, he um, did his uh, university studies in geology and paid for it through the GI Bill. And uh, so when Vietnam came around, he got called in to serve. At that point in time, he was, uh, you know, he was married and uh, my oldest brother had been born and, and uh, he saw the military as um, job security, which at that point was more important than his own pursuing of his, of his own goals. So he stayed many, in that career. How many siblings did you grow up with? There were six of us. Uh, so five boys and one girl. Mm. And <laughs> you're in the middle, you're you're in the middle, middle of the top. bunch? What's that? You were in the middle of the bunch? I was number four, yeah. Okay. Four of six, not, not seven of nine, but four of six. <laughs> <laughs> so <clears throat> during all of this time, um, were you interested in religion? Had you been thinking about being a priest or a brother? Or did you know the Jesuits? Was any of this in the background? Well, I was a devout Catholic um, and- um, None of that was the past tense. That was before you became a Jesuit. <laughs> <laughs> I still am a devout Catholic, I, I should point out. Uh, and uh, in fact, a week or so ago, I gave a wonderful talk uh, to the MIT Tech Catholic community, which is re really where I was originally formed in my faith. I grew up Catholic, but I didn't really learn much. Um, you know, the, the CCD teachers when I was in elementary school were well-meaning parents who really didn't know much and so didn't teach much. Um, and so I didn't really learn much about my faith until I Left, left the home and, uh, and uh, went to college. So the MIT Tech Catholic community was kind of where I really started learning. Um, and uh, uh, so just last week or, or a week or two ago, I, I gave a talk to the Tech Catholic community uh, about uh, faith and science using all the wonderful stuff that I've learned in my many, many years of Jesuit training and my experience here at the Vatican Observatory. And it, it went over very, very well. I should point out that uh, they, okay. uh, they enjoyed it. They, they learned a lot, so. So you were, you were at MIT in the 90s, right? In the 90s, yes. Did you overlap with Bob Moran? Uh, I did not. Um, he was the, I, the chaplain there when I was there. Right, and, and he, uh, he had been gone for about 10 years, but I actually encountered him when I was a novice. Oh. So uh, we, it, I, I did my novitiate in between 2001 and 2003 in uh, St. Paul, Minnesota. And um, to kind of share resources, uh, various classes about ecclesiology and, and various related subjects, uh, we would share classes with the other uh, novitiates and postulancy programs for the various different religious orders and congregations in the Minneapolis St. Paul area. And so he happened to be the, um, the novice master for the um, Paulists right. uh, who were in, in the area. So, <laughs> so I encountered him there. Excellent. So anyway, to go back to, you know, you're, you've graduated from MIT, you're in grad school. Was uh, the idea of being a member of a religious order anywhere in the back of your mind? It, it cropped in. I mean, I think that the call was there, but, but I wasn't paying attention because obviously I had my own plans. I was going to get my PhD in something cool in astrophysics and go on and earn a Nobel Prize and, and all that. I mean, you know, that's like what everyone does, right? But when I was at WashU, uh, that's when I started to recognize that I was being called a religious life. And also I was having a pretty rotten time in the graduate program there. Um, I really had no energy or attention for the research that I was doing. And uh, 
which I think gave me the opportunity to pay attention to a few other things like where God was calling me. And then uh, I recognized what was called a religious life. And so, okay, what order? And this is where the Holy Spirit comes in because uh, the obvious answer was Jesuits and I cannot tell you why that was the obvious answer at the time. I knew nothing about the order. I only knew one Jesuit who happens to be on this call. Uh, <laughs> uh, and he was not a very good role model. <laughs> Thanks. Where did we meet? You have to tell people how we met. Oh, it was um, the American Astronomical Society meeting in 1995 in Tucson. I uh, it was my first double AS. Uh, I was an undergraduate. And uh, so during the poster session, I was wandering around because nobody stands next to their poster during the poster session. Um, and I happened uh, to pass by the Vatican Observatory booth where I see this strange bearded character who's sporting a very large brass rat, which I noticed because I at MIT. And so I get to talking. <laughs> You were unhappy at Wash U, and eventually you left there with a master's, as I recall. Yeah. And so uh, then I uh, spent a couple of years teaching at Bowling Green State while I was discerning my vocation. And in 2001, I entered the novitiate in St. Paul, Minnesota. Why a brother? During the process of my discernment, uh, during you know, my getting to know the society during those two years at Bowling Green, I, I got to know a lot of Jesuits. And it was actually while I was already in the process of applying to the society that I started to realize, you know, I, I really love the Jesuits. I, I really feel called to this vocation. Um, I'm not really sure about the sacramental ministry. And when I look around and think about who are the Jesuits that most resonate, the, the ones that I really kind of connect with, they're all brothers. And so then I said, hmm, I think I need to pay attention to that. <laughs> okay. So you did your two-year novitiate in Minneapolis. And then where'd you go? And then I studied philosophy at St. Louis University. And All then right. uh, I went off and taught for a year at, at Rockhurst University in Kansas City, during which time I get a phone call from a certain brother guy who says, Oh, I actually should go back in time a bit. While I was studying philosophy, one summer, I, I was looking for something to occupy myself over the summer because there's no classes, no philosophy classes during the summer. So, um, and I, I was exploring all these different possibilities, none of which were panning out. So I, I, I knew a guy, I gave him a call and I said, do you know of anything I might look into? And he said, hey, why don't you come to Rome and work with me? <laughs> so I spent a summer, uh, working on meteorites here at, at the observatory. Um, at the time, I knew that you had been in this meteorite lab, and I thought you were a meteorite person, not an astrophysics person. You know, <laughs> foolish me. Yeah. But uh, it, as I've mentioned, it was uh, really tough on me having someone else in my lab because it meant I actually had to show up every morning and do some work, which in the summertime, you do tend to goof off, but you wouldn't let yeah. me. Oh, just in the summertime. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm goofing off right now. Um, so, uh, so, so yeah, so while I'm then in, uh, uh, doing some teaching at, at Rockhurst University, I get a, I get a call from Guy saying, I have a friend who is a professor at the University of Central Florida, and he and I have collaborated quite a bit, and, uh, and he has, um, funding to do the kind of research that we were doing at the observatory, but to expand it to work with meteorites in institutions around the world and just scale it up a whole bunch. He has the funding, he has the, the equipment and resources, he just needs a grad student and because he wants to get this process underway quickly, he's hoping to find somebody who um, kind of already knows what they're doing. And uh, I told him I happen to know somebody who already knows what he's doing <laughs> and needs a PhD. <laughs> so the plan was you were going to get a PhD in record time, like what, two years, we thought, maybe. Yeah, which, of course, if you know how PhDs work, 
you know, you have two years until graduation for about five or six years before you actually graduate. Um, so how long did it finally take you? It took me four years. Okay, still pretty good time. Uh, and uh, with a little pressure from my committee because uh, I could easily have, you know, oh, but there's this other institution I like to go to. This is other institution, yes. So, so you I don't have enough data yet. And the committee's so, like, yes, you do. <laughs> so, what, so what was the actual research you were doing? I was studying the physical properties of meteorites. So density, porosity, magnetic susceptibility, and measuring these three properties for as many meteorites as I possibly could. So where'd you go? About 1,200 for the, for the thesis. And it involved meteorites from uh, the Smithsonian, from the American Museum of Natural History in New York, the Field Museum in Chicago, uh, the Natural History Museum in London, the Vatican Collection, obviously, um, and several university collections as well. So um, you've got you've your thesis. Now what do you do? You're ready to join the observatory? Oh, well, no, I still need to do theology. So I go off and uh, spend two years uh, at Boston College doing a master of uh, theological studies at Boston College. So this is your third master's degree? Yeah. <laughs> And then you join the observatory. There, there is a saying about Jesuits that uh, we have more degrees than a thermometer. So you've come to the observatory. What, what year was that you finally arrived? Uh, 2013. It was uh, a few months after Pope Francis was elected. All right. Now, since then, you've had some fascinating bits of research. You've been able to do these kinds of measurements. What are probably the most interesting rocks you've been able to measure? a few rocks that are actually uh, not meteorites. They're what I call field specimens, moon rocks from the Apollo missions. How and, easy is it uh, to get pieces of, moon, of Apollo samples to measure? You, know, when you apply to, to CAPTEM, which is the uh, allocation committee uh, for, for lunar materials. And uh, we managed to convince them to let us work with about a hundred or so, about 60 specimens, uh, about two kilograms or more of total mass of material uh, from the Apollo missions. Uh, and uh, the way we managed to, uh, to get access to that quantity of material was by uh, saying all of our equipment is portable and is non-destructive uh, non and, and non-contaminating. Um, so we can kind of set it up in the facility at NASA. And, uh, uh, and so instead of actually taking the moon rocks out of the facility, we can just work on site. And they're like, ah, sounds like a good idea. <laughs> and uh, they actually um, were the ones that got us into using laser scanning for, for some of the density measurements. In the past, we used a technique that had been pioneered by Brother Guy to immerse the meteorites, or moon rocks in this case, in glass beads. Um, but uh, there were some questions about the potential really trace contamination uh, from the glass beads. And, and they said, hey, you know, we've got a laser scanner here. Why don't we try that? And so ever since then, Instead of using beads, I, I, I use lasers for, uh, for those density measurements. We have a, a laser here in, in my laboratory uh, that is the same make and model as the one at NASA. So uh, my collaborator, Walter Kiefer, can go there, do some measurements, and then send me the data, and I can process the data here. So the way the laser scanner works is it actually makes a 3D uh, virtual image of the object, and then you can then count up by the, from the points the volume of the object. Yeah, right. So this is um, your your deep ambition, of course, is to be a mad scientist. You now have a laboratory with a laser built yes. on the lip of a volcanic crater. Oh, I have a volcano lair. Yes. yes. <laughs> and and minions who work with you. Well, they they mostly just get in the way. 
But that's yeah. what minions do. That's what minions do. They're, these so, are these little plastic images from the movie Minions. If you're, and the one thing I do want to have you talk about before we go to answering some of the questions is Lucy. Yes. So there is a space mission in the works. It's going to launch in October 2021, so a little less than a year from now. Uh, and the, this mission will visit at least six Trojan asteroids. So Trojan asteroids are uh, asteroids that are out at the orbit of Jupiter, but are 60 degrees ahead or 60 degrees behind Jupiter in that orbit. They're, they're trapped in Lagrange points. And they have been trapped there theoretically for, well, from early ages of the solar system and may have uh, preserved certain types of, of asteroids that otherwise had been depopulated when uh, material got ejected in the early days of the solar system. So uh, the idea kind of is that, or the hope is that these, these asteroids may represent kind of a missing link, I guess, in, um, in the history of the solar system. And hence, hence the name Lucy, which connects to the, the early hominid Lucy that was discovered by John, Donald Johansson back in back when. And actually, funny thing is, on the way out to the Trojans, the mission is going to pass by an asteroid in the main belt. And that asteroid had not been named prior to the mission, so they, uh, so they gave it the name Donald Johansson. So. <laughs> I had no idea that's where the name came from. So it's not an acronym for anything. No, it's it, it, that's one of the few missions that is not an acronym. It is actually a name. So but, what's your role in the mission? Um, what does it mean to be on a mission? What do you actually do at this point? It's not even been launched yet. You're not building equipment for it. What are you doing? Um, a lot of this, what's going on right now is a lot of remote observing of the targets. Uh, so this involves uh, some radio astronomy, this involves a lot of telescope work, and it involves also uh, when there are occultations, so when a star is going to pass uh, behind one of these targets, then um, what they'll do is they'll set up telescopes in the path of that shadow, and from observing the, the profile of of the as the light disappears and comes back again, they can they can learn a little bit about what's going on around the edges. But also, if you have enough telescopes, you can develop a shape profile of the objects, and you can really pin down some of the size the size and other parameters uh, by doing this. So that's a lot of what's going on right now, science wise. There was also a lot of science going on in terms of trying to anticipate the uh, how good the observations are going to be in terms of you know when they observe it they're going to try to create a, a model of the, the shape of the object um, and that depends a lot on the angle of the light how good um, so as the, you're, you're passing by the, the distance, the, the angle of the sunlight and everything determines how much information you can get. Uh, so the, a lot of the work that's going on right now is anticipating that kind of stuff. Okay, there's a, a couple of uh, questions we've got here. So the, uh, first of all, who's launching Lucy? Whose mission is this? It, uh, the, the PI is, is Hal Levison at Southwest Research Institute. It's a NASA mission? It, it, is a, it is a NASA mission. And a, a couple of questions that come up about uh, your work back dealing with interstellar dust. So you've got these micron bits of dust. Are they radioactive? Is there anything you can determine from radiation that they emit? I mean, they've been out in space all that time. They do not emit radiation. Um, the way we learned about them, the, the, the way they, they were studied is through uh, secondary ion mass spectroscopy. So the idea is you, you shoot an ion beam at the, uh, the 
specimen and spall off ions from the specimen um, and then accelerate those ions through a mass spectroscopy as a ma mass spectroscope. And uh, so the primary thing that they were studying in this is, uh, is the various isotopes. So isotopic ratio is very big because that's, that's one of the ways you can tell that something actually did not originate from the solar system is if its isotopic signature is way off of, of solar. Um, so the, the ratio of, of oxygen 16 to 18 or the ratio of uh, um, the various uh, isotopes of carbon or various other things. And also from those data, you can also begin to, to understand where these things originated. And also, um, depending on how, your, how good your models are, the conditions in those environments where those things originated. Because for instance, some, um, one, of, one of the more interesting things that we see are graphite grains with in the very core, you know, the way you study this is through a, a, a TEM, a transmission electron mic microscope. The very core of these, of these uh, graphite grains is a, um, a titanium carbide grain, a very tiny one. So basically a little tiny titanium carbide and then graphite sort of accumulates around it making a, a larger grain. Um, and so the way that thing had to form is you have certain conditions that form the titanium carbide and then other conditions that allow the, the graphite to start to begin to accumulate on top of that. And that puts some constraints. We know these things originate in, in AGB atmospheres, but it puts some constraints on the conditions in those atmospheres because you can only form the grains under certain conditions. And uh, so it, um, one of the, the ideas that came from that is that the, the, those grains formed in a, in a jet, um, a polar jet from, so you, so you have the titanium carbide forming in the atmosphere, but then it enters into this jet and the graphite is, is added in the jet. Things like that, it's kind of cool. The other thing that I always found fascinating is you're talking about you have the sample and you're shooting ions at it. How in the heck do you get this sample out of the meteorite? Um, these days you don't. You actually study them in situ. You slice your meteorite and uh, and then scan the meteorite. Um, uh, do an ion scan, uh, sort of raster over your your surface, and study it in situ. Um, in the past, what they would do is isolate them chemically by dissolving, so, and what you, so this is for studying something like silicon carbide, which is very chemically resistant to, uh, to, to various different uh, attempts to dissolve it away. So you basically dissolve everything away except the silicon carbide. <laughs> and uh, uh, and that's, that's kind of how that, um, that's done it is what they call uh, finding the needle by burning down the haystack. This is actually um, an interesting thing in my role as curator um, or in my collaboration with other curators is one of the questions that we as a curation community have is uh, how to curate these Jerry's tiny microscopic uh, uh, fib sections that, um, that you know, what sort of policies, what sort of practices should we use for, for keeping track of these things and, and curating them, which we don't have a good answer for at this point. <laughs> well, that reminds me of another great job that you did as you've been the curator since 2014, but you've been active in organizing the other media right curators around the world. Uh, tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, so, um, we as a group have been gathering at conferences, meteoritical society meetings and lunar planetary science conference um, for, for a lunch or a breakfast or uh, just an informal gathering of about a, um, 
an hour or so during these conferences, uh, which is a very difficult time to get anything done because everyone's ordering their food and eating and, and they have to worry about getting to the next session and whatever. So uh, I, I suggested one time that um, wouldn't it be nice if we actually held a dedicated workshop to meteorite curation? And uh, so invited everyone out to the Vatican. And so we held a, a workshop and it was a, a smashing success. Um, and everyone, you know, by the, by the end of the meeting, everyone was saying, when's the next meeting? Which unfortunately we haven't had time to schedule yet because COVID and stuff. Um, so we had the very first meeting, uh, the very first workshop on the curation of meteorites and extraterrestrial specimens here at the Vatican. And the, we had you know, the curator of the Apollo specimens. We had uh, a guy who was curating the, uh, the Hayabusa return specimens of Japan from the asteroid Itokawa. Uh, and, you know, all, all my friends and the usual suspects. <laughs> Speaking of these uh, asteroid sample returns, do you have any hope of getting any materials from either the Japanese or the American missions that are bringing samples of asteroids back to us? Well, none of them are going to come here to the Vatican Observatory, but I might go to them. Uh, I've been talking with a guy at the University of Arizona who has been charged with measuring the physical properties of these return specimens from Bennu, from the Osiris Rex mission. Uh, and so he has asked my expertise because I've done a lot of work uh, in this field. And uh, I may go and help him out with some of those measurements. Since this audio is recorded, Brother Bob has indeed been invited to be a participating scientist to help measure the physical properties of materials from asteroid Bennu, sampled by NASA's OSIRIS-REx Asteroid Sample Return Mission. This mission is due to return its sample to Earth in early 2023. Brother Bob has also taken up 3D printing and has created an impressive replica of St. Ignatius Cathedral with Father Angelo Secchi's Spectroscopic Observatory on top. This is on display at the Vatican Observatory Museum. You can check out Brother Bob's YouTube channel, Mackie Makerspace, that's spelled M-A-C-K-E. That's a wrap for this podcast. Our audio editors were Brother Guy Consolmagno and myself, Bob Tremblay. You can listen to our other podcasts and read our posts on the web at vaticanobservatory.org. If you'd like to attend our full moon meetups live, join our Sacred Space Astronomy community, also at vaticanobservatory.org. Clear skies, everyone.